Bluestone makes investment loans simple with competitive interest rates. Borrow up to 85% of the value of your investment property without paying lender's mortgage insurance and no cap on existing investment portfolio size, plus personal Bluestone support from application to settlement. So don't wait to unlock your future. Bluestone, award-winning home loan solutions. Find out more at bluestone.com.au slash investors. Lending criteria, T's and C's and fees apply. Credit provided by Permanent Custodians Limited Australian Credit Licence 390183. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Hi, good day, everyone. Hey, guys. Phil Tarrant here, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Hope you're well. Hope you're immersing yourself in uh, some of the great content on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. There's uh, heaps happening there at the moment, and uh, I've been at this game for a little while, and uh, I must admit that uh, it's always a challenge to synthesize the information we think is most important to be reporting on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, but now more than ever before, it's flooding in our door from right across the nation and globally. Everyone's got some sort of sentiments towards property markets in Australia right now and what you should be doing. So um, tough job for our content team, our editorial team, who are every single day the driving force of smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. So if they don't run your stuff, don't give them a hard time get in contact with them, and they're always looking for a good story. So you can engage them, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. And whether or not um, you're in the business of property investment and you're providing services into property or you're a property investor yourself, we'd rather, and we like to hear from property investors right across the nation, how they're seeing the world and shaping their uh, portfolio building approach. You can come onto the podcast. We love investor stories. Email the team, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, and we'll get you on the show. Lots happening. Um this is something we've been working on for a little while, and you might not have checked it out yet. Uh, we've talked about if you tune into the podcast the portfolio update, where we talk about the smart property investment portfolio, and we've been doing this for uh, well over a decade now, where we share what's and all our journey investing in property and what we've done right, what we've done wrong, and what we've been a bit mediocre of. And I'm pretty frank in my assessment on how we go, and I give myself a bit of a hard time. So go and tune into those episodes. But one of the guiding forces for us to grow out our portfolio and make sure it's informed and we can make informed decisions around it was a pretty robust sort of spreadsheet we put together around it, which we've occasionally made available. I'm happy to report now that is it is available online. If you go to smartpropertyinvestment.com, you'll see a big box that says download the Smart Property Investment Master Portfolio Sheet. We've done this in conjunction with uh, some of our friends over at Atlas Property Group. Go in there, you'll see it, download it. Uh, there's some example properties in there. No doubt the formulas work. If you find any anomalies, let me know. But um, I have it on good account that it's hard. it all works pretty well. But it's going to give you, if you don't have something or you've got something pretty mo- mediocre or or um, not too sophisticated in mapping your portfolio, whether or not you've only got one property, you can plug it in and play with it and start going with it. It's going to give you some insights that you may not have. So smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, it's on the homepage right now. Click on the button. You can download that. Uh, any feedback, uh, again, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. So lots happening in property at the moment. I thought I'd bring a couple of folks into the podcast. You may or may not have heard of them before, Cameron Mekaliff and Fergus Halliday. Cameron, yes, he's backed by popular demand. Fergus, this is your first Smart Property Investment podcast. You guys are both journalists, uh, the backbone, the heartbeat, the engine behind Smart Property Investment. How are you, gents? You well? Yeah, well, thank you. Nice little rev up there. I yeah, appreciate that. You like that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm you, all right as well. Yeah, hey, how are you finding it, Fergus? Um, it's good. So, yeah. It's good. It's a, It's definitely a really interesting, rich area, lots of interesting stories and details and yeah, having a great time. So how do you guys go about, just to give some sense to my earlier comments about what do you work out what you actually write about? You know, it's a hard job. A hundred percent. That's one of those things where property is so busy, it's so diverse. And yeah, you sit there and you kind of hope to try to see what the, I guess, reader themselves would like to know about. So yeah, very, I, very questions driven. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And um, is there anything that you particularly like writing about, Fergus? What's your, what's your sort of your, oh. your pet little project at the moment? Um, I'm always very, I'm, at the moment, I'm spending a lot of time looking at a uh, fractional property investment and sort of how how that potentially, whether or, whether or not that actually offers a reasonable or more accessible way into the market for those who can't necessarily, um, don't have the money for a deposit right now. Mm. And sort of like those new emerging opportunities. Yeah, there's a lot of tech now going yeah, around definitely. fractional property investment and um, you know, the power of the interweb and, and how smart it is these days. There's some people some bright people makers are pretty interesting apps which allow for fractional property investment. So rather than owning a couple of I guess a couple of points to it, rather than owning 
a property outright. You own a part of a property and you can transact in and out of it quite easily. Uh, that's one thing. So you might not be able to afford a full property. So at least you can still benefit from the current uplift in property and property markets going cycles, obviously. So it may and will go down at some point. But the other point being uh, the fact that you can diversify your spread across multiple markets, multiple assets. So yeah, go and check it out. There's some really good providers out there. We talk a lot on uh, smartprotinvestment.com.au and no doubt look for some headlines there from Fergus. Now, Cameron, let's get into some of the stories that are dominating the coverage on smartprotinvestment.com.au right now. And uh, I'm having to report again, Traffic off the roof, uh, off the roof, out of, out of, out of mind. It's a lot a, of green numbers. A lot of green numbers. Everything's going north. <laughs> um, there's a lot of property investors out there right now, and, and it feels like they're, they're all connected in with smart property investments. So uh, thanks so much for um, drawing and turning to the website. There's heaps of information on there. And uh, if you're only new to podcasting, we, we literally have years of podcasts now. So I think we've probably covered every type of scenario or situation or strategy or tactic involved in a property investment over many years. So whichever podcast player you listen to this on go and check them out now Cameron Westpac's latest predictions now you gotta wonder and I'll preface this with uh, how much you can rely on bank predictions because this time last year some of them were predicting 30% plus decreases in property but anyway uh, Westpac's latest predictions 15% growth this year 5% next year and zero in 2023 with markets in Melbourne and Sydney said to, to contract by 1% in 2023 what do we know about this? Oh, so you've got to be pretty happy if you're a bank first and foremost. They reckon Sydney's going to go up by about $225,000 on average. They think and then in year one. Next year, it's going to go up by another $65,000. Melbourne's pretty similar numbers. You're looking at one ninety five dollars and $50,000. And then you're going to sit there and have, they're going to basically shrink by 1% in as macro prudential regulations come in to try to slow the markets down. Interesting out of all of this, though, is the fact that Brisbane and Perth is actually not going to slow down. It's going to keep growing throughout. It's going to grow in 2023 and 2024, which is very different compared to where it's been the last, I guess, five years or so. Mm. So, and Fergus, no doubt you're experiencing this as you navigate smartprotinvestment.com. Everyone loves a prediction. Every property investor <laughs> loves a prediction, particularly when it says they're going to make more money. Yeah, uh, numbers so go up. Numbers Great. go up. Numbers go up. Good. 15% <laughs> growth this year, 5% next year. Like, it's a good time to be a property investor. That doesn't mean, and these are pretty generic as well, they're talking about Sydney, right? Sydney's a big place. And this doesn't necessarily mean Everywhere in Sydney is going to grow by that amount. Some is going to grow more. Some is going to grow less. Some may even go backwards, right? So it still comes down to where you choose to invest and why and how and the type of asset you're getting. But don't get too caught up with these predictions. They make great headlines. We love writing about it because people like reading about it. But nothing wrong with being clickbaity. Yeah, well, you know, we don't clickbait. <laughs> uh, but it's what people want to read. You know, it's just it's like you know the immediate satisfaction of knowing that uh, your property's going up in value. I think that's a. Uh, a bit of a driver for a lot of property investors. But, you know, that's Westpac's latest predictions. All the banks come out with this stuff. All the uh, lenders come out with this sort of stuff. So, you know, if you get them all together and mundle them up, some of them say the same thing. Some of them say very different things. But there is some pretty measured comments um, and commentators uh, around this. A lot of think that smart property investment will fall into that bucket. We weren't predicting dire decreases in property prices uh, as COVID kicked in in sort of March, April last year, like some of the banks did. And I think of some other informed people that said, stay the course, property will do well. And here we are in that market right now. So um, Fergus, let's have a chat about uh, auction clearance results. And it's a bit of a, a test for attitudes and the speeds of markets. We'll just go to a break before and stay with us back in a moment. Whether you're a seasoned property investor or about to buy your first property, finding the right investment property to buy in 2021 isn't easy. Why do it alone when you could partner with award-winning buyer's agent, Paul Glossop? Over the last 10 years, Paul has helped hundreds of clients build multi-property portfolios. Paul's secret is finding off-market bargains that get snapped up before the general public even gets a sniff. Interested? Head to purepropertyinvestment.com today to schedule a strategy call with Paul Glossop. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm here with my colleagues uh, that work across the brand, Cameron Mekaleff and Fergus Halliday. Now, Melbourne's uh, auction resilience, you know, auctions up the last weekend, clearance rate 71%. The actual state and uh, Melbourne, at least, was uh, in pretty dire lockdown. So the fact that I was able to move and get those numbers, irrespective of some of the COVID restrictions. Cameron, what do we know about this, mate? I say, is it actually such a surprise anymore? Like this is their fourth lockdown. So business has actually kind of moved on. So they actually know how to work around the virus itself. And now you looked at Melbourne, you had 880 auctions throughout over the weekend. You had $407 million in sales. And it's because I guess investors aren't as worried or concerned as they were 
in the first lockdown, the second lockdown, they know what's happening. They mm. can work through it now. So they're pretty much as busy as usual for hundred percent. Exactly there. it. And so are they all online or are, are people allowed to rock? Are you allowed to leave your house for the purpose of going to an auction? I don't know what the, what Not the rules really. are. Not really. It's very like one person at a time, masks on, all of that sort of jazz. Yeah. So <laughs> even though Melbourne went into lockdown, but it would have been a whole bunch of people that were set for auction. There would have been a big discussion, no doubt, between every vendor and real estate agent going, it's gone to lockdown, do we wait, do we wait, do we wait? But I reckon they just went, nah, go ahead and do it. Exactly. And the numbers say that, he's, as you just said, 880 people still bought a house. So- mm. I guess it's not that much of a worry for them. So have you looked into auction clearance rates across Sydney and some other areas? What's happening there? Sydney and was slightly higher, yep. as you kind of expect. It was near, nearer the 80% before, obviously, that was numbers before final auction clearance mm. rates. So it's about 9% higher. Okay. All right. There you go. And, and Sydney and Melbourne are auction markets. So I was in uh, Brisbane um, this morning actually having some meeting with some folks who were sort of connecting in with property. And uh, you know, they're even seeing a spike in auctions out there where, uh, that way, which normally – Brisbane's not necessarily a big auction suburb, so uh, auction location. So real estate agents up there now are seeing, hey, take your uh, property to uh, auction. You never know what may happen. Fergus, the story here that you guys have been working on um, around Airbnb yeah. entering a long-term rental market. This is interesting. The, it people is. have been thinking about this is going to be happening for, for quite some time, but what's your thoughts on this and what's the market saying? Well, the news kind of kicked off last week at a earnings call for Airbnb where they revealed that around a quarter of their bookings in the first quarter of 2021 were long-term stays, which is basically a term that means longer than 28 days. And so their CEO, Brian Chesky, talked a lot about how they're trying to look at expanding the business and maturing it out so that they can cater for this an expansion into the long-term rental market rather than traditionally short-term rentals, which is what people mostly know. Airbnb for. So it's really interesting, I think. There's a lot of interesting comments out there from Chesky sort of talking about how he thinks they can offer a meaningful difference uh, and that eventually things like deposits or things like proof of income deposits and credit scores won't factor into whether or not you can secure long-term accommodation through platforms like Airbnb. And they obviously... Uh, they've had a lot of success disrupting the short-term rental market. So it'll be very interesting to see if they continue in this direction. Yeah, it's... um. You know, and, and there's a lot of people in real estate who are sort of concerned about these big sort of global players, mm. big tech companies disrupting things. And and is this essentially Airbnb becoming a traditional property manager? I don't know? know. It's very hard to say. I don't know if um obviously they have they do have a track record for successfully disrupting parts of the industry before. But I don't know if it's necessarily worth assuming that they will succeed to the same degree. The long term rental space is a little bit different. I spoke to Archer Stars, Dr. Andrew Wilson about it, and he sort of said that it's a very, there's definitely a business opportunity there for someone to come in with that kind of like tech first platform approach, but also to a degree, Airbnb are kind of battling their own brand in the sense that they have built themselves up as the go-to short-term rental player. And that if they did enter the long-term rental space more seriously, they're up against places like Domain and REA. And so it's just, it's just a, it's a very interesting development, but it's maybe too too early to really gauge the scale of it. Yeah, and I think what you can expect in property, in particular property management, is uh, change, evolution. Uh, there's a lot of hmm. tech coming down that pathway right now, uh, of which I'm a big advocate of. Um, you know, as a property investor myself, you know, I turn to my property managers to do their job as effectively as possible. And if they're leveraging technology so they can spend more time doing other stuff, I think that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, whether... Airbnb will become an organization who becomes a big brand in property management, like long-term property management, yet to be seen. You, who'd you say? You were chatting with Andrew Wilson when yeah. you were around this, and he's always got a pretty informed decision. What what else was he saying here when you had him on the phone? Oh, he, um, I mean, we talked a, a bit about just the natural sort of uh, opportunity there in terms of that offering, a, if there's maybe a way that Airbnb could offer a lower cost alternative to the service that Domain and REA provide. But to a degree, they're sort of going to struggle against just the orthodox and just the established way that things are done yeah. in countries like Australia. Yeah, there's a lot there. Hey, um, Cameron, I was going to chat to you, mate, about – so we're recording this on the Thursday after the Tuesday of the RBA rate announcement. You know, you've written a piece here, What will it, and you asked a question, what will it take for the bank, the Reserve Bank, to lift the rates and how it will impact property investors? What's your thesis on this, mate? I don't think they're going to lift the rates till 2024, to be honest with you. I think they'll change macro prudential policies around this. They'll change the way people can get loans themselves. But they've come out and said themselves, the RBA, that house prices aren't their problem. And 
I guess there's two ways of looking at that, whether you sit there and think it's a good thing to have a rising market or you sit there and think for first home buyers is a bad thing. But mm. I guess that's just time will tell, I guess. Yeah, there's a quote here. Oh, you say uh, Governor Philip Lau has been loath to suggest that the RBA could lift rates early despite skyrocketing house prices and rising bond yields. However, his deputy governor, Guy Diebel, indicated that the bank could move sooner, saying, quote, it is the state of the economy that has a key determinant of policy settings, not the calendar, while warning that monetary policy was not an appropriate tool for alleviating house price concerns. I've spoken to quite a few people within government around this, see people within government, and they're quite happy to let property run as it is right now. They're going, well, yeah, let it go, let it go. If Australians are feeling wealthier, guess what happens? They spend more stuff. And, and then that's you get your unemployment rate down to your 4.5% that you're aiming for. You get your inflation up to your 2 or 3% and then everyone's happy. Everyone's happy. That's what they're trying to balance. But this is uh, we're not economists. We uh, we learn on other people <laughs> for having those uh, discussions. Uh, stay with us. We're going to go another break. When we come back, we're going to talk some Sydney stuff back in a moment. Are low interest rates impacting on your investment returns? It's time to rethink. Rethink Investing creates wealth for clients through the strategic purchase of positively geared, high cash flow commercial property. Industrial properties, retail assets or office spaces can be a smart investment option that produces significant and long-term return on investment. Rethink your investment options and look to commercial property. Learn more at rethinkinvesting.com.au. Rethink Investing, Australia's number one commercial buyer's agency. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, Cameron McLiff and Fergus Halliday, the editorial team, the content team at smartproductinvestment.com.au. You'll hear more of the, from these guys moving forward. You probably see their bylines all the time, but we'd like to get them to get behind the news, what's happening, and give some sense for the commentary and the narratives and those discussions they're having with um, people that work in property and, and giving those views and opinions. So, yeah, Favourite interview yet, uh, Fergus, that you've had since you've been with Smart Property Investment? Anything that you've particularly gone, oh, I really enjoyed that? Oh. I enjoy talking to people about uh, fractional property. I mm. mean, as we mentioned before, like yeah. they're all, it's all very exciting and they're all very passionate about it. And yeah. What's your view of that? Is that sort of as a young bloke thinking, oh, I want to get into property. Maybe that's my, my I mean, pathway. I mean, it's it? inevitably, that's definitely part of the lens that yeah. I have to look at it through really. But also I'm a little skeptical of like as a model, theoretically, this could have been around a lot longer. Yeah. But. It's not necessarily taken off, so I'm kind of very curious about, about why that. is that. And I think yeah. you'll find um, Just, regulation around is always a bit of an inhibitor. And mm. with most technology, when yes, can it be done? And the tech's been around for a while now. Mm. Can it be done? Yes, it can be done. But does the apparatus to facilitate those sort of transactions taking place and the governance around it exist? Well, it probably needs to change a little bit. And when you know, you're not talking about you know, well, you can do it in shares right now. You can buy little bits of shares and stuff, and it's been around. That's what shares holding is fundamentally. Um, but um, yeah, very different to property considering uh, there's a lot of wealth tied up in property and governments make a fair bit of money around property-related transactions. So, you know, it's um, on the radar for most people, but we enjoy watching how that plays out. Now, a story here, Fergus, uh, research by PRD uh, is declared Sydney is the most affordable city for first-home buyers. They have. This comes as a surprise <laughs> because over the, for the last five years, everyone's been complaining about how unaffordable Sydney property is. Tell me about it for well, first-time buyers. I mean, fu- fundamentally, it depends how you define affordability. Mm. As you said before, we do receive a lot of reports uh, and research into the property market at Smart Property Investment. So, PRD's new affordable living property guide sort of measures affordable and metropolitan suburbs through a number of criteria, such as livability, investment return, and whether or not there's any development in the area. And the way that they sort of ultimately measure affordability is how much money will you save if you go to an affordable suburb versus a living in the metro area of a city? And so they're comparing the difference, the premium you're paying for living in the metro area to how much is that premium if you're living in an affordable suburb yeah. in that 20 kilometer, I believe. That's in rabbit's inverted commas. And affordable. <laughs> so, yes. so what's an affordable suburb in Sydney? They've got a few. They've got a few listed Blank here. Look right there. Yeah. Uh, they got a few. A few listed here. Mossman. <laughs> no, no, not Dude, quite. That's not bloody affordable. Um, yeah. Karingba, Janali, and Peakhurst are the three that they call out. Are they really? That's, that's sort those of are, south. Yeah. That's what they're sort of calling it. There's a few of them around the south. Yeah, but basically, if the they've decided Sydney is the most affordable because, mm. as opposed to if you were to consider Brisbane or Melbourne or Perth, they've crunched the numbers and determined that. Choosing an affordable suburb in Sydney means that you will save more in aggregate versus saving more if you were to choose an affordable suburb 
in Brisbane or Melbourne. Partial, but doesn't yes. that just mean that the metropolitan area itself is overpriced? <laughs> if you're saving more going 20Ks out, this may, means the maybe, centre's Karen. very more expensive. <laughs> that, that may be the case. <laughs> well, I think you've seen the dynamics change with this as well because, you know, the the uh, the logic used to be invest or live with so close mm. to the city centre that you can do everything you need to mm. do. Now, everything now is you don't have to live near Sydney to be living near a CBD. So, mm. you know, COVID has really accelerated this. But, you know, if you live in the Penrith area, you live in the Hornsby area, you live in the Campbelltown area, you live in the Liverpool area, I'm talking about Sydney there specifically, it's like you're living close to the CBD because everything is there. Jobs are there. Sports are there, recreation is there, entertainment is there, you know. So you're going to see this changing over time, and it is getting more affordable in that regards as people change their mindset around it. But you know, as a property investor, this whole affordability debate, a lot of people actually start investing in property for the basis of affordability. They might not be able to buy the house where they want to live, but they're happy to rent where they want to live and buy where they can invest in. And that's a great enabler for property investors in that, you know, you can find $400,000 house locations in Australia. You can find $300,000 house locations. Right? You might not necessarily be able to find them in Sydney, but there are locations elsewhere that allows you to actually get into property and the sort of asset classes that you want in markets that should grow over time, but just at a more affordable price point. So, And you're uh, right about a Sydney wage going a lot further in a regional area than mm. where it does compared to Sydney wage going in a Sydney area. So yeah. you, you automatically increase your buying power very quickly by doing that. Yeah, you've got to change and shape your attitudes towards it. That's the reason why you get these rent investors, right, who might live in Sydney, but they invest in, in Brisbane or Melbourne or Tasmania or whatever it is. But uh, So you, you're both sort of young blokes who probably get to the pub on a Friday night or a Saturday night with your, with your mates. Um, do you get asked questions about property? Do they know what you do? They go, oh, what's going on? And property investors are evil because they're making it so hard for them to get into the market. Is that the sentiment? Look, with, there's with a little the bit of anti-boomer uh, sentiment in all of that, of course. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't think it's too much of a surprise. I'm, I'm not a boomer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> clearing that one out very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think a lot of the people sit there and understand that it's difficult and it's not really that surprising. It's now nine, nine and a half times in it basically and a wage now in buying Sydney and Melbourne. So people sit there and go, things are getting harder for everybody. But at the same time, I don't think too many people sit there and think it's impossible either. Mm. I think the Australian dream is still to own your own house. Yeah. And you're talking there about metrics. I think it's IMF, uh, which is International Monetary Fund metrics, which is a, a base global view of how affordable property is. And they're saying, well, it's nine times the median or average salary, therefore property is unaffordable in Australia compared to other parts of the world where it's a lot less. And it's an argument that always gets banded around, particularly around election times. But um, Australia has a pretty unique set of circumstances. That's because we have six cities where everyone else kind of has a lot of more global cities. Like they we do. <laughs> and there's only bits of Australia where you can actually live. And by the way, it's a pretty good place to live as well, right? Goes so all right. That, uh, that helps quite a lot. But, you know, because I, I speak to a lot of younger property investors and you know they don't subscribe to the idea around it's impossible to invest in property and they're happy to compromise you know well no one's doing it now anyway but like overseas holidays and all the mod cons to to um you know try and get some shekels together to start investing in property is that sort of view of your peer group are they they happy to go without in order to try and create wealth uh, overall yeah probably yeah. a couple of my mates probably not but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd sit there and say yeah as a general rules as a generation yeah of course yeah everyone sits there and knows that you know you've got to Bit of hard work to get you at the start and you eventually get there. Like, mm. that's a known fact still. This is it. Good. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I enjoyed uh, chatting. Um, what's moving ahead for you guys? Uh, any key headlines? What's what's uh, any sort of little pet project you're working on you think you can share with us? All yours. Ah. That's not around <laughs> fractional property investing. <laughs> I've recently been turned on to note investing, and so I'm having a little look at that. Okay. After fractional, this is my next could this be a way in okay. sort of story. Well, there you go. Well, yeah. you know, it's a property investment is a broad church. Mm. I guess the sort of guiding philosophy for us here at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au is having those discussions and, and uh, writing the articles and having informed uh, narrative with uh, – people in the know to help you shape your attitudes towards property investing so you can make more informed decisions. So uh, stay with us. We're on air all the time. Smart Property Investment uh, podcast, uh, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au is where you need to go. If you're a social media type of person, you can find us, uh, Smart Property HQ, if that's how you like to get your information. Hope you enjoyed this. We're going to do a lot more of sort of uh, going behind the news, so watch this space. Until then, uh, we'll see you next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. 
Bluestone makes investment loans simple with competitive interest rates. Borrow up to 85% of the value of your investment property without paying lender's mortgage insurance and no cap on existing investment portfolio size, plus personal Bluestone support from application to settlement. So don't wait to unlock your future. Bluestone, award-winning home loan solutions. Find out more at bluestone.com.au slash investors. Lending criteria, T's and C's and fees apply. Credit provided by Permanent Custodians Limited Australian Credit Licence 390183.